So what I'm going to talk about here is personas. Uh, look at the process of social perception, look at stereotypes, and tell you about a little study that we did trying to figure out how practitioners navigate the conflicts that we see with personas. So personas are fictitious characters. They're used to represent users in terms of their goals and their personal characteristics introduced by Alan Cooper. Personas kind of become a blanket term. There are many different um, variants, many different adaptations, and it's really one of those concepts that has been widely accepted in different shapes, ways, or forms, but widely accepted. Now, why is that? It could have to do with this illusion of superiority. We trust ourselves and we trust our perception. It could also have to do with this quote that's attributed to Mother Teresa, uh, saying, if I look at the mass, I will never act. If I look at the one, I will. So individuals, individual people have this intuitive appeal. And personas draw on our ability to easily form impressions of other people and then make um, inferences. So there are benefits that we see from that in HCI. We say, okay, we can bridge the gap between stakeholders, we can prioritize, we can prevent I methodology or self-referential design or the fundamental design error. The interesting thing is that all these benefits are based on a certain assumption. And this assumption is that personas can manage to actually create an understanding of another person from within their frame of reference. Okay, this is what's called perspective taken. And in stating these benefits of personas, we are implicitly assuming that personas can do this, that they are actually um, able to help us to empathize with other people. Now, what's interesting, what you might not know, other disciplines or areas that um, rely on this kind of empathy, like negotiation training or conflict management, they have a lot of times given up on trying to teach empathy because they realize it's too hard and it doesn't really work. We're still trying to do this and we do it with personas. And of course, if we're looking at personas, we try and give um, data a face, okay? We're given a face and what we also know, of course, is that this face adds an additional quality to it. There's this um, beautiful example by the agency Zone. They tweeted this a while back, which I says pretty much um, shows that um, the data and the persona that you then attach to it adds something else. We usually assume that um, personas should be empirical. Not all of them are. There are fictitious personas, ad hoc personas, center mac personas, and so on. But in most cases, there's a great emphasis, actually, on um, empirical evidence as a source of validity. But, of course, by developing personas, we're also simplifying the data. A uh, persona might have a different approach on a technology if their parents had migrated to the country, if they had children, um, if they were transsexual. And these are all different categories that intersect, and we can't all consider them in a persona or in a persona set. So there are oversimplifications here, and what kind of oversimplifications are we talking about? What are we doing here? This brings us to social perception. Personas actually foreground people in the design process. So um, they, are, they fall prey to, they rely on social perception, and there are many different processes, actually, that social perception is based on. Let's look at one of them, okay? This is um, because personas are, by their very nature, limited in the information that they're presenting. And so they are prey to a bias that's called uh, wisiati. What you see is all there is. Um, this was coined, uh, this term was coined by Daniel Kahneman. And uh, the example that he gives is think of a strong, intelligent leader. Okay? Just with those two attributes, you already got an image in your mind. Now, I add something else to that. Think of a strong, intelligent, and corrupt leader. The whole picture is actually changing, okay? 
But what happens here is when we get information, we're not asking ourselves, oh, how would I see this information if I also had this additional information? So we're not doing that. For a persona, this would mean, okay, here I have this persona. I'm not asking myself, how would I react if it said that this persona was homosexual? Uh, Would it matter? Chances are it would. So would that matter in the design process? That depends on me as the receiver, amongst other things. Would it even be helpful to know if they were homosexual? I don't know, because obviously this additional information would be subject to cognitive biases again. Um, Don't know if you've ever seen this. There are design teams, and then you have this persona, and there's like a detail added, like, owns a cat. Okay, so owns a cat, so you got this team sitting there saying, ah, what should I do with this? Owns a cat. Should I maybe do a little feature for the cat or how they get fed or something like that? And then somebody else said, no, come on, this is a persona, you know, they're just adding this to give you a feel for the person. This is like a cat person, you know, they're submissive, they're subordinating their life to a cat, and then they're like, what do you mean? I own a cat, you know? So you got this discussion going on. Are these fruitful discussions? Maybe the way I'm asking this question, you think it's a rhetorical question. I expect you to say no, but actually I'm not sure because if we're bringing personas, if we're bringing people into the design process, then we have to deal with this process of um, impression formation professionally. And that means dealing with my defaults, dealing with my assumptions and my biases and everything. This brings us to... Stereotypes. Stereotypes are oversimplifications of a complex social reality. They tell us what millennials are like, what old people are like, what feminists are like, what men that take parental leave are like, all these different things. And most people, like probably most people in this room, um, are motivated to be unprejudiced and do not endorse blatant negative stereotypes of other people. However, Modern research on stereotypes has actually shown us that usually these stereotypes, which are cognitive structures, associations that we have, work implicitly, that they work without our conscious endorsement. If you ever feel like you got a big ego that day, you should then you could go do the implicit association test and actually find out about your own Um, stereotypes because what we have learned about stereotypes is they do not stand by themselves. They come in a triad, okay? And this triad is we have the stereotype, which is a cognitive structure. We have a certain attitude, which would be the prejudice. And the third thing that we have is the behavioral part, which would be discrimination, for example. Now, you could say, why do we even separate them? Usually, they, are, they come together. You know, I think that um, people, I have this cognition that overweight people are indulgent, can control themselves, and the emotional pressures, I don't like that. And my behavior, I avoid them, or at least when I'm offering everybody another serving of dessert, I don't offer one to them. You know, that would be a discriminating um, behavior. But what we have found is actually that I do not need this prejudice. I don't need that negative judgment for a stereotype to result into discrimination. So um, if we look at that, that's, of course, extremely relevant to personas. You know, I, I, might, think, I might think that refugees are, should be welcome. I have no negative um, feelings towards refugees. Still, if I'm walking down the street and I see somebody beside me that I classify as a ma- male refugee, I might clutch my purse a little tighter. I might make sure I got my um, cell phone in my hand. So here we got um, these associations that actually result into behavior without our, um, without any prejudice as an intermediary. So this is extremely relevant to personas because we want people to act based upon personas, and all they can do is based upon the things that they implicitly and explicitly know. And so there's a great danger here that, of course, with this knowledge that they have, they're reinscribing the stereotypes um, that they have. And of course, if we're looking at what we're doing with design, then reinscribing the stereotypes would be recreating a society 
as it is, recreate the um, societal status quo, for example, a society in which we perceive females need special protection or whatever it is. So um, here we're reifying the stereotypes, perpetuating the status quo, which is, of course has been heavily um, criticized, for example, by, by feminist HCI. And so what we did in our study, and I hope with this very, very brief look into social perception, into personas, it has become clear that personas do have some issues. Okay, and if we're um, working with them, there are certain things or there are certain things that practitioners then would have to navigate that they would have to um, deal with. And so that's what we want to try out. How do they navigate these issues? How do they navigate these conflicts? And so we um, looked at usability requirement engineers um, and um, try to figure out, okay, how do they perceive it? It was um, seven experts. They, were, they had IT backgrounds, no social science background, but they were all experienced both in academia and in the corporate IT world. We, we looked for these people because we wanted, um, we were expecting reflection um, from people then. We did a qualitative um, analysis and um, all the, all the practitioners that we interviewed actually said, okay, um, they, they have a user-centered way of um, approaching this. The results, seven themes kind of emerged in our interviews. Some were um, in line with, with what we found in the, um, in the literature and others were a little surprising actually. So the first one that emerged was this assumption that anyone can use the persona method and anyone can actually use um, personas. There was like a certain limitation that was like um, a special characteristic, like people who are real nerds might not be able to do it, but everybody else should be able to do this. So it wasn't um, something that they thought was impossible. The second one here was very much in line with the main benefits that we found in literature. Personas are there to create empathy. And of course, um, the, the experts that we interviewed then saw themselves very much as a mediator um, amongst, the, amongst the developers and amongst the design team and everything. So the method kind of gained a pedagogical quality to it. The third one was personas as communication tools. So personas as boundary objects and our, um, our interview partners here saw themselves very much um, in, in working with these boundary objects. And the fourth one is about personas and political agendas. And this is the point where the interviewed experts actually differed most in their opinion. There were those that said, okay, personas are a good way to actually highlight the needs of users that are easily overlooked. And there were others that felt very strongly that this should not be done, but actually you should make absolutely sure that you're representing the majority so that it should be the typical user. Um, some, even, some even said, okay, it should, be, it should be a stereotype so that it seems authentic. Okay, so this was also, so they felt there was no space for highlighting the needs of my, minorities or less um, stereotypical users. The fifth point here, objectivity and um, validity, was um, actually one where we found that the experts found it very difficult to deal with personas and at the same time keep their claim of being an objective researcher, okay? So we had different paradigms at work and if we're looking at the, the interviews here, this is where they contradicted themselves more, where there were lots of different, um, or were lots of inconsistencies and we kind of felt that these were symptomatic for the challenges that actually are involved in user-centered design with um, the, different, the different paradigms. Um, the last point here, the image of the persona method then kind of also gave this uh, um, political, political frame because we found this need of the experts to actually justify their user-centered work, them with their pedagogical approach. Um, they try to do this by stressing that it's objective and valid. You know, It's something that's done in HCI, so it must be good and I'm going to do it. 
and um, in the interviews, the expert um, drew a strong picture of the other. So there seemed to be a greater conflict here between their user-centered approach and their pedagogical approach and the technical hard science that was actually at work and that was more valid and more um, powerful. So what, what we found was that the experts um, had drew this image of the persona method or perceived it as being esoteric. And this is actually something that they said by themselves in several interviews. And it was something that they felt they had to defend themselves again. And it framed the experts' whole outlook on the persona since less technical um, then in the environment they're working um, in means less important. So to conclude, it's actually somehow surprising that the persona method uh, carries this image of being easy to use and somehow hands-on because actually it implies um, a lot of automatic processes, implicit processes that indicate just the same. We're bringing um, persons, we're foregrounding individuals in the design process and then make the personas inherit all the difficulties and biases of person perception. And so in our interview study, we want to find out um, how our usability experts deal with these issues. And what we actually found was that the thoughts about biases did not play an important role in the interviews, and it actually seemed like the political landscape that they were moving in in the corporate world did not leave room for this reflection. So um, the, in their perception, the IT world showed very little acceptance of user-centered methods, and that, thus they kind of needed to defend themselves, saw their professionalism um, at, as being at stake. So they responded to that by trying to present the, the persona method within the paradigm of value-free science, which, of course, um, is, um, is difficult to say it the easy way. So the takeaway message then would be uh, personas are great because they do rely on this intuitive appeal. At the same time, they run risk of reinscribing um, stereotypes. And what we maybe need to be aware of is that usability experts in organizations are very much busy defending usability uh, or user-centered methods per se, and um, we can't really expect them to facilitate a reflection process that we would actually need to work with personas, but we as an HCI community, we feel, should find a way to ensure that they are actually dealt with professionally. Thank you.